Veronica, we're live now if you'd like to start. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Veronica Pedroza, and I'm with the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights as advocacy and campaigns consultant for Myanmar, and I'll be moderating this news conference. For those of us who've been following the situation in Myanmar through the years, it's perhaps clearer than for others what a unique and important moment this is for the outside world to get involved in what's happening in this, the biggest nation on mainland Southeast Asia. We have a distinguished panel of experts to explain the situation and the choices facing the Association of Southeast Asian Nations currently uh, undertaking their annual leaders summit and related summits. First, I'd like to introduce the chair of the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights and Malaysian MP, Charles Santiago. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, shall I start? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Veronica, for that introduction. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to welcome all our journalist friends uh, for this important uh, press conference and also welcome Excellency uh, Yubo Latint, uh, who is the ASEAN Minister uh, representative from the National Unity Government, together with uh, Ken Omar and Debbie Stothart uh, for this uh, press conference. Uh, yesterday, for the first time, uh, the ASEAN Leaders Summit and related summits took place in the metaphorical empty chair, empty chair, where a representative for Myanmar is supposed to sit. APHR or the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights has, uh, has been encouraged, deeply encouraged by the ASEAN Foreign Minister's decision to exclude Myanmar's military chief from the ASEAN summit. It was an unprecedented and a significant moment uh, in ASEAN's development. Uh, and it also shows that ASEAN is serious about holding Senior General Ming On Lai to the five-point consensus reached in Jakarta uh, in April this year. We recognize that this was an important step in the ASEAN context. However, much more needs to be done and lots, lots more need to be done to demonstrate ASEAN's seriousness, um, difficult as they may be, to the block. When I say ASEAN's context, everyone understands that what that really means. Given how little ASEAN has been able to define itself beyond anything but the lowest common denominator, also known as the principle of non-interference. Sometimes it is it's as if ASEAN is its own worst enemy. Make no mistake, the horrific nightmare that senior senior, senior officer or senior general Ming on live is unleashing violence, unleashing violence on his people is also an unprecedented opportunity for ASEAN leaders to move beyond their air-conditioned corridors of power, to help save lives and bring peace, help prosperity to our strategically important region. If saving people's lives isn't enough to convince them, then what about the credibility of the organization? ASEAN leaders know very well that it depends on its ability to act decisively and bring the Myanmar military junta to end its relentless campaign of violence, killing against the people of Myanmar. It's actually in ASEAN's best interest that it takes steps to make ASEAN centrality a reality to credible, decisive action to back up its own agreements, statutes, and charter. If not, it's reason to exist. It's very reason to exist is in peril, at least not an exaggeration. My colleague Kin Omar of Progressive Voice will tell you much more about the hardship and extreme violence the junta is forcing on its people. Let me just say that according to the UN Interim Residence Coordinator in Myanmar, in the eight months since the coup, half of the population is living below the poverty line. The number of people needing aid has tripled from 1 million to 3 million. As the Philippines Foreign Secretary Teodoro Lokchin says, as I said recently, 
if ASEAN does not take a tough stand on Myanmar, it will be seen as a bunch of guys who always agree with each other on the worthless things. This is another moment when it's plain for everyone to see that the fate of ASEAN is intrinsically bound to the fate of its people, not its leaders, but its people, whether they like it or not. ASEAN must continue to press Myanmar Sunta to concrete measures to progress a five-point consensus. We would like to remind uh, our extinguished journalists here uh, that the three is still, there is no sign that the junta is willing to cooperate. There was an announcement, a very weak announcement, release of thousands of prisoners immediately after ASEAN's announcement, but it simply wasn't true. Not only were far fewer prisoners released, but many were re-arrested. The military seems not only to have total contempt of the ASEAN leaders' agreement, and ASEAN has continued to invite and welcome representatives of the Myanmar junta to lower level meetings within ASEAN. So I go back to my point, much more needs to be done if ASEAN wants its own legitimacy as a key regional player that can bring peace and stability. As an outcome of this summit, EPHR calls for ASEAN 1 to immediately meet officially and publicly with the representative of the National Unity Government and open dialogue. Number two, stop inviting any other junta representative to ASEAN official meetings until there's an end to violence. All political prisoners must be free and restoration of democracy in the country. The members are not the only governments at the summit. We also have the dialogue partners involved in this, this summit that's happening right now. Dialogue partners also have a key role to play in supporting and pushing ASEAN to do what is necessary for the people of Myanmar and the region. As members of the international community, they have a role to play in the face of international crimes. So we urge governments around the world and partners, uh, dialogue partners, ASEAN's dialogue partners in particular, one, to continue to extend sanctions against military officials and their economic interests. They include oil and that includes oil and gas, which is the Junta's main source of revenue. Number two, officially meet with the NUG National Unity Government to extend solidarity for the people of Myanmar who have relentlessly supported democracy since the coup at the cost of their own lives and livelihoods. Number three, support international accountability mechanisms, including through the UN Security Council, other UN mechanisms, as well as through universal jurisdiction cases. And finally, I like, just like to say that there's only one place where Min Aung Lai should go next, and not the ASEAN's next meeting, but a court of justice. Now, the, a further point to be made is this, that is on the humanitarian assistance within ASEAN. Uh, Charles, Charles, I might I will ask about that a bit later. Okay, okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Charles Santiago. Um, actually, there was a bit of a problem with your audio was crackling a bit. So what we can do is to offer to our participants your talking points a bit later, uh, or with a or a draft transcript, something like that. But we thank you very much indeed for that. Um, uh, those your speech, your initial address. Thank you, Charles Santiago. Thank you, thank you very much. Now, it's our very great honor and privilege to introduce um, to the world, in fact, the very newly appointed, um, uh, really ambassador or representative for the Myanmar National Unity Government to ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and that is U Bo La Tint. He joins us from the East Coast of the United States. And he's somebody who's been involved in kind of external relations for the pro-democracy movement of Burma for many years now. Um, Ubo La Tint, um, I very broadly would like to ask you why uh, ASEAN should be dealing with the national unity government as Charles has just called for. He's just said that the world should now already be dealing with the NUG. We've seen that with a lot of different um, uh, governments around the world, including the United States. I saw there was a note that uh, I think it was the state secretary the, uh, who said that the um, national security advisor has been meeting with the NUG. The US national security advisor has been meeting with the NUG. So why is it? 
Well, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Veronica and the APH uh, inviting me to be part of this panel. So, and first of all, I'd like to say that my appointment as an ambassador to the uh, ASEAN by uh, Foreign Ministry of the National Unity Government is, uh, you know, demonstrate that readiness of the National Unity Government and Democracy Movement of Myanmar to work with the ASEAN leadership as well as ASEAN community uh, to find a viable solution, durable solution of the current political, humanitarian, and you know humanitarian and uh, human rights crisis in our country. So and thus ensure stability and peace in the region. So it is obvious that military hunter in Myanmar fail to cooperate or to work with the ASEAN and international community, not only the ASEAN leadership, but also they deny the special envoy, not only from the ASEAN, but also from the United Nations. So the last six months has been furthermore, they been punishing the face of ASEAN leadership under the five point consensus agreement, they continue their reign of terror and campaign of terror, as well as they didn't allow the visits of the special envoy to meet with the all concerned party. And at the same time, they are the root of course of the totally collapsed, almost collapsed economy and health and education system in the country. So at the same time, they are not supported by the majority of Burmese population, that is the most key for the ASEAN to consider whether they're going to work with the few military hunters who are not lack of support by the Myanmar majority people, majority population of Myanmar, and are they willing to work with the who are ready to work with the regional association honestly, at the same time, legitimacy own national unity government of the Union of Myanmar or by the people of Myanmar. So it is obvious that we are ready to work with ASEAN and regional community as well as international community or ASEAN dialogue partner to ensure the regional stability as well as all these sustainable solution of the crisis, all the crisis we are facing uh, in Myanmar today. That is a short answer to your um, question that why NUG should be in place of a military junta. So it is very obvious that the 2020 pro election provided the popular support and legitimacy to this NUG government. Only NUG has the legitimacy and vote by the people to work with the regional and international community and they and itself speaking out and appointing me to work in debt with the ASEAN counterparts so that I am very clearly want to say that we are ready to work with the ASEAN. We will not tarnish the integrity and legitimacy and credibility of ASEAN, but we will be very responsible counterpart in the region for the future so that we want to be part of the ASEAN society, active member of the ASEAN in constructive way. But when we talk about the constructive mean, it is ASEAN and ourselves must be engaged with the people of Myanmar as well as people of Southeast Asia. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much indeed, Ubo La Tint. I just want to um, ask participants, I'm sure that you have a lot of questions about um, what we're going to talk about today. So I would ask you to please write down your questions in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. And that's when we will, and then we will have questions after we've heard from our final speaker. 
Kin Omar, the founder of Progressive Voice, and before that, of various other organizations, civil society organizations. She's really been a mainstay of the pro-democracy movement of Myanmar for so long. And it's great to have you here. Thank you very much indeed. Kin Omar, I know you've been working around the clock trying to uh, push this uh, junta out of, uh, out of their situation at the moment and their apparently their strategy that apparently seems to be about total destruction of the country, given what Ubo Latint has just said. Thanks, thanks, Veronica. I just want to start saying that the progressive voice, uh, we have joined the brief people of Myanmar's spring revolution and civil disobedience movement in welcoming the ASEAN's decision to exclude the hunter from attending the summit. That's a huge step. But let me also share our view that we still disagree with the ASEAN for still inviting the hunter's representative, regardless of whether political or non-political, as long as the chosen representative represents this terrorist military, we will continue to reject their presence at all ASEAN summits and other platforms, as anyone appointed by them do not represent the people of Myanmar. Besides, the ASEAN's decision of inviting a non-political representative is an attempt to depoliticize an issue that is absolutely deeply political. This decision also tells us that the ASEAN is still hesitating and indecisive in addressing our, our country's situation. This means further bloodshed for the people of Myanmar ahead. Myanmar people continue with their rejection of this regime, this hunter. Peaceful protests continue every day. Civil disobedience movement joined by more than 400,000 civil servants remain strong. Even a few thousands of soldiers and police have already defected and joined the people. And yet crisis has reached to the breaking point because the hunter continues its campaign of terror across the country with no sign of stopping. There, is a mass, there are mass killings, mass arrest, torture, rape, and also mass displacement, and many other forms of uh, human rights violations uh, and violence and atrocities are happening. As of October 26, the hunter has killed at least 1,213 people. The actual number can be way higher. 9,223 people have been arrested, 7,025 remain under detention, according to Assistant Association for Political Prisoner. Conflict has intensified across the country that poses a grave threat, not only to the people of Myanmar, but also to the regional peace, human security, and economic stability. As this military hunter has deliberately targeting civilians breaching the Geneva Convention and committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. Over 250,000 people being forced to flee from the hunter's attacks. Now, as the hunter is preparing another wave of clearance operations called Anorata and Bayinau operations in Chen State and Zagai region respectively, we will be seeing another wave of atrocities very soon. And these operations are a plan of a deliberate retaliation in forms of collective punishment against the people for rejecting and resisting the attempted coup for, by this military, which is failing. This hunter has total disregard for human life. Unless they are held to account, Myanmar has no chance to move forward. The international community must step up to end this hunter's campaign of terror and assist the national unity government in steering Myanmar towards Myanmar towards genuine federal democracy, particularly the ASEAN. It should be very clear to ASEAN by now that the ASEAN alone cannot tackle the human rights and humanitarian crisis that are unfolding in Myanmar. These crises have been created by this military and thus partnering or working with the hunter will bring only more harm to the people. It is crucial that the ASEAN work with the national unity government, the people representative democratically elected government of Myanmar, and seek out a UN coordinated response together in response to the crisis in order to end this bloody coup attempt and save the people of Myanmar. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kin Omar of Progressive Voice speaking there. <clears throat> we have had um, a few questions here in our Q and A box, a reminder that our participants can uh, put their questions there and we'll put them to our panelists in turn. We're also joined, I want to say, by Debbie Stottard of Altian Burma, with, with, and she can assist with answering questions. Great to have you here, Debbie. 
Um, actually, the first two questions are quite um, are quite similar. So, if I'd like to read them out, one there is they we don't have an answer. We don't have a proper name for that person, um, but it's very similar to the next one. Ko Nang from CRPH NUG Support Group Australia says wants to know why ASEAN invited a non-political representative to the ASEAN meeting, that the ASEAN consultation clearly states that the representative should be um, elected by the people, uh, and that's the leader who should attend the ASEAN meeting. NUG ministers are the Myanmar people elected and they should be attending ASEAN meeting. What is ASEAN's next steps to pressure on the junta? So I'd like to um, put that question. I think probably Charles Ubo, Omar and Debbie can, can have a go at answering that question. Ubo, maybe first of all, you or Charles, first of all? Yeah, I, I give you Charles uh, the first uh, response for that question, the regional perspective. Is that okay, <laughs> Charles? Yes. Uh, um, I, I think uh, uh, our position or the APHR position was uh, we should, and from day one, we were quite clear that uh, Min Ong Lai uh, uh, orchestrated a coup d'etat against a civilian government. Uh, this government was elected by the people of Myanmar in their elections in 2020, 2020, sorry, 2020, and, uh, and ASEAN has got no business uh, legitimizing uh, Min, Ong, Min Ong Lai. That was our position from day one. Uh, but unfortunately, ASEAN sees it quite differently. And ASEAN, in fact, we also recommended at that time that the NUG be uh, invited for the ASEAN meetings in April uh, and to be part of the discussion that took place, uh, that, that came up with the five point charter. Uh, but unfortunately, that did not happen. Uh, what happened was uh, Min Ong Lai was present. Uh, and uh, I think, um, and clearly, he was part of the process of determining uh, the five point process. And clearly, now he has gone back against it. And I, and I think, in some very funny way, uh, one can say that ASEAN uh, has finally been exposed finally has been exposed uh, that one of its own leaders is a crook. Uh, it's a guy who was, who was there, who said and discussed uh, the way forward, but was never committed, was never committed to following through uh, with the five-point process. So it's a wake-up call for, uh, for ASEAN uh, that it has to go back to the ASEAN Charter uh, and, uh, and, and be committed to the ASEAN Charter and not to play, play politics, uh, especially those groups that, that seem to be supporting uh, Myanmar within ASEAN itself. ASEAN Charter is very clear. It's about rule of law, it's human rights, promoting human rights, promoting democracy, protecting human rights and promoting human rights and, uh, and good governance. And all of this was thrown in the basket in April. Uh, but now ASEAN has to wake up and realize that they were taken for a total right by uh, General, uh, uh, Military General Amin Ong Lai. Uh, and I think this is exposed uh, 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 ASEAN in a very big way. Thanks very much, Charles. Actually, Debbie, because you've had so much exposure to ASEAN and the way that ASEAN works, perhaps you'd like to answer this briefly as well before we go to Ubo, because there are quite a lot of questions for Ubo in the chat in the Q and A box <laughs> by now. I feel like I'm. I, am I the ASEAN grandmother in the room? <laughs> because we've been working on human rights in auntie, ASEAN for more than thirty years. Anyway, um, this reminds me of um, the the whole uh, fight to stop Burma from chairing ASEAN back in two thousand and six. In fact, that was the impetus that led to the formation of ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights at that time known as ASEAN Interparliamentary Caucus for Democracy in Myanmar. It was formed in 2004 and, uh, to spearhead the campaign to prevent Burma from chairing ASEAN. Uh, at, at that time, it was the regime under the command of Senior General Tan Shui. And also at that time, it became very clear in ASEAN there were certain member countries such as Indonesia and Malaysia who felt very reluctant to allow Burma to chair ASEAN, but also there were active dialogue partners such as the US um, who cooperated in Malaysia and Indonesia's campaign and the, and the, M, and the ASEAN MPs campaign because uh, Condoleezza Rice at that time said, I'm not going to any ASEAN summits in Yangon. 
And so that really also was one of the factors along with a whole range of other factors and pressures that compelled uh, a kind of a, a ASEAN to, to allow a face saving measure for the junta to withdraw from chairing ASEAN uh, under the guise of being busy with uh, its constitution drafting process. So I think here we also see that Malaysia and Indonesia had a role um, and also that um, ASEAN was under so much pressure because the junta failed to cooperate on some very basic elements of the five point consensus. We actually saw that um, in after the five point consensus was adopted, there was a 27% rise in military attacks and violence on civilians. And the core demand of the core point of the five point consensus was a cessation of violence. So we, 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 it was very, it's very clear to us now that ASEAN has said, okay, this is too difficult. We won't let General Min outline in the room, but we have to make sure that this is not the only point because this is the problem. In those days when Burma withdrew from the chair and ASEAN said, okay, finish. We don't have to push the reform agenda. That problem is off our plate. So now we need to make sure that um, uh, the responsible individual ASEAN states partner with ASEAN dialogue partners and the UN Security Council to push this further so that it's not an issue of just getting rid of a, a inconvenient problem for ASEAN. It's an issue of making sure there is a restoration of democracy and peace and human rights in the country. Thank you very much. Ubo, would you like to answer the question, please, about um, ASEAN? Uh, what do you think ASEAN next steps should be? Well, ASEAN, if uh, we expected ASEAN to be real regional association who concretely uh, decisive, provided the concrete uh, decisive leadership, not in the manner of uh, existing way, at the same time, when they want to make sure that you know, for example, like ASEAN uh, humanitarian mechanism is not ready for the uh, the man-made disaster uh, crisis crisis in Myanmar today. They are just for the natural disaster uh, to be able to tackle natural disaster in in the region. So that if ASEAN itself to be able to implement a five-point consensus, ASEAN really need to admitted that the whole reform process must be taken place first, ASEAN itself, before they tackle the problem in Burma. At the same time, they need, they cannot walk it alone and they really need to work with the United Nations and NUG and other dialogue partners to ensure that the effective and principle delivery of the humanitarian aid is reaching to the needy people and the conflict affected population and vulnerable population in Myanmar. So that, first of all, my point is that ASEAN itself need to uh, address the reform its need to able to work it out what they decided on the April 24 five point consensus before they talk with or get in, into the country. Do they have readiness to be able to deliver the much needed or urgently needed humanitarian assistance to uh, the suffering people in Myanmar. So that at the same time, how can they avoid it? Participation of the military haunted, who are the root of the cause and all of these crises in Myanmar today. So how they can avoid it, participation in decision making or delivering the needy, uh, humanitarian system that has been manipulated in the past. We have well recorded about the military nature of the, you know, using the international humanitarian aid for their own benefit, not for the uh, population uh, really needed. So that my answer to that question is that it is time for ASEAN leadership to ready to become a very decisive association in decision-making process. And they have to just not taking out or 
you know, making vacancy of the Myanmar Sea. But also they have to be really uh, able region association in order to take not only the problems in Myanmar, but also in the future, wherever the whole region can uh, happen, all these kind of man-made disaster have to be, you know, able to protect and ensure given the needed answer by the ASEAN. So that we want ASEAN leadership to prove that this from this summit, not only the vacancy, the, the seat of Myanmar, but also they take further concrete steps to become a real regional association that will be able to cover all the issues we are facing, okay. uh, challenges in Myanmar and other uh, country of the member nation. Okay, we have a question from- uh, Veronica, can I? Yes. Can I come in this? Yes. Uh, can I come come in this? Uh, I think uh, this meeting is uh, important for many for many reasons. But one of the reasons why it is important is because now you will have Cambodia chairing ASEAN beginning 2022, which means that uh, in the context of Myanmar, we will have a new special envoy, and that envoy would come from Myanmar after uh, from from Cambodia. So the foreign ministry of Cambodia would now nominate somebody to become the uh, special envoy for Myanmar. Uh, I think what we need to emphasize is we cannot have a repeat of the Brunei experience or the Brunei special envoy's experience vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar. So for example, one where he went the first trip to Myanmar and he said, yes, ASEAN will support uh, the elections in 2023 and ASEAN will bring the election monitors to do that. We do not want that to happen. Number two, we also do not want a situation whereby the special envoy will not be able to meet the different uh, stakeholders, including political leaders, as part of the political process. So therefore, it is incumbent upon ASEAN leaders at this meeting to be decisive, to be absolutely decisive in the way forward and articulate a clear way forward though, so that by end of next next year or mid next year, we really have a, a, a constructive process or development in achieving the five point plan. Otherwise, this will be another talk show. So I think ASEAN leaders have really to buck up uh, and, and I think they have to clearly outline what is the mandate, what is the responsibility, what is the scope of the special envoy and within that, to put clear out, uh, outcomes that he has to meet by, by April, by May, by June. Otherwise, again, we will have the same meeting next year and, uh, and we will have achieved nothing. So therefore, this meeting is very crucial in that sense. Cambodia is seen as, some, uh, as, as a country quite sympathetic with Minong Lai. Uh, and therefore, having a special envoy from the country could also mean he or she would be sympathetic as well. But therefore, ASEAN needs to leverage. ASEAN leaders need to leverage their position and outline a clear plan of action and a clear set of outcomes that they want to be seen by March, April, May, and so on and so forth. So a six months, there must be some kind of, of within the first four months, there must be a clear uh, outcome and where the special envoy can report Yes, I met so and so, and this is the outcome. Uh, this is the way forward, uh, and this is what I have done. Otherwise, uh, Veronica, unfortunately, we will have a same similar situation as Brunei. Nothing much would have happened, though. So, therefore, I mean, we, we want to move ASEAN from no action talk only for doing some something real action on the ground vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, um, Charles. And I think that the summit is particularly empowered under the Charter to make such decisions yes, and responses. And I think that was something that, that was written about um, quite recently by Adelina Kamal, I believe her name is from the, the former head of the uh, ASEAN Humanitarian uh, uh, Assistance Center, when she was saying it's up to the summit to make that point. And that was from a humanitarian angle only. Now we have questions from Hui Yi Tan. Hello, how are you? Um, from the Straits Times, and her questions are for Ubola Tint. 
how has ASEAN engaged the NUG so far, is her question. And actually, that's the same question as Nian Nian from the Irrawaddy News. What do you expect most from this current ASEAN summit regarding Myanmar crisis? And are you in contact with the ASEAN leaders? Could you share about any upcoming talk? Well, the first part of the, my answer, the first part of the question is how we engaging up to now with the ASEAN leadership. On the 23rd of October, our foreign minister, Dosema Aung, sent a, a letter to the ASEAN uh, rotating chairman, the Brunei leadership, as well as ASEAN secretariat that with the readiness of the nation and unity government to work with the ASEAN leadership as well as ASEAN community. Uh, in that sense, the, as a legitimate government of Myanmar, they appointed me as an ambassador to ASEAN and uh, they expected fully facilitating uh, as a legitimate representative of the legitimate government of Myanmar people. They already sent out this letter to the secretariat as well as secretary uh, general of the ASEAN secretary, uh, Teria, as well as the rotating chairman of uh, the ASEAN at this point. But we didn't receive any formal or informal response up to now. This is very, uh, very frustrating for the uh, NUG as well as for us. Second point is that what we expect from this summit, I totally agree with that point Charles made before me. So that ASEAN need to be very decisive. That existing decision making process, existing humanitarian wing, the way it is formed, or readiness of these, all these kind of needy area has to be seriously reviewed and must be able to, you know transform into the real applicable structures or mandated. Without the clear mandate of the ASEAN leadership and decision-making, any agency or any wing of the ASEAN, particularly not only particularly in Myanmar, but also in the future, conflicted area will not be able to bring up the desire result what the expected uh, by the people of Myanmar. So that in short is we want ASEAN leadership using this opportunity and this summit to change their style of you know, taking too long to make an important decision. But this is the condition on the ground and situation in Myanmar is challenging them. If they continue as it is, status quo, or if they want to be a real effective regional association at this moment. So we, on behalf of the Myanmar people, we expected ASEAN leadership to be decisive and which way they're going to choose, whether they're going to work with the failed military coup leaders or legitimately elected representatives of Myanmar people. That is what we expected. At the, we truly, un, truly understand that the name, based on the nature of ASEAN, it will take certain time, but it will not unlimited or you know, endless time. We expected ASEAN leadership realize that they also in the pivotal role of ASEAN international attention so that they cannot go like that ahead without giving response back to the, their dialogue partner who are endorsing them as a the role to play to find the sustainable solution in Myanmar. As it is, without addressing the concrete uh, transformation of their necessary area of the strategy as well as mandated way of ASEAN, the five point, even the five point consensus plan of ASEAN cannot be implemented as it is. So we want the ASEAN leadership seriously see that point, clearly see that point, and this summit must be not end of the process, but very beginning of the process, but very indecisive 
we, we don't expect it. But ASEAN leadership on behalf of the ASEAN society, they must be very decisive, which way do you want to go ahead? Thank you very much, Ubo Latent. Um, I'm just going to give you a little break, um, but I do want you to answer this, the next question I'm going to ask um, after we've heard from Ken Omar, because Omar, I think this is a question that you, I've, I know that you can answer as well. It's again from Tan Wei Yi of Straits Times. The US State Department counselor, Derek Chole, mentioned recently that the US continues to encourage the NUG to unify the pro-democracy movement. To what extent has NUG done that within Myanmar? I know that you are on the NUCC, the National Unity Consultative um, Committee. Can you, can you speak to that, please, Omar? Thank you. Um, before that, I just want to clarify, I'm not on the NUCC, but I'm actually in the, uh, the joint committee of the NUCC and the NUG on the UN credential issue. Oh, um, just, just clarification. Yeah. Um, but what has uh, NUG done uh, for like unifying? Um, first is the it is starting with the spring revolution, the people actually come to unify, they have come to join hands in solidarity across board, you know, those uh, uh, like uh, ethnic uh, communities who actually have uh, exper experience or who have suffered for so long of their military's uh, atrocities and violence and abuses for generations. Now, uh, joined by the uh, majority Burma population who never experienced the um, armed conflict or such level of the atrocities from that military. So now that's actually, there's people's solidarity in Myanmar has been strongest ever that we have, we have seen and experienced. Um, in that spring revolution, the, the national unity government, of course, as the people elected government, placed the, uh, the front, uh, front line major uh, uh, cent cent center role, central role, where they are working together also with the ethnic armed organizations who've been you know, fighting for the uh, federal democracy for a long time, for the ethnic equality self-determination. Now the ethnic armed organizations leaders are now together, uh, working together with the NUG towards establishing the uh, genuine federal democracy. So that, uh, that vision for future Burma, future Myanmar, that is, uh, to guarantee the equality for all the communities, regardless of their ethnic and religions. And this is the vision that has been set from the spring revolution, pass it on to the national unity government, pass it on to the national, uh, national unity consultative council, which is a more of a broader and inclusive political body uh, that will you know, lay the uh, direction and the policy of the uh, spring revolution and the movement together with the national unity government. So I think it's a, you know, what we have is this most promising prospect of Myanmar, which the ASEAN leaders really need to embrace. They need to actually learn and, and really come to understand, you know, the dynamics and the aspirations of Myanmar people from all corner of the country in the last nine months that people are not going to turn back or turn or go back to the status quo before the military coup, which was the last 10 years, sort of like a, a power sharing between the military and the civilian uh, democratic, uh, democratically elected civilian leadership. But that's not what the Myanmar people want anymore. They're done, they're done. They're completely done with this military who is nothing more than a criminal gang and terrorist organization. So basically, Everybody is looking forward, moving forward, which is the uh, genuine federal democratic union. And national unity government has brought these different forces to be able to work together. In fact, you know, if you look, look at like the, the national unity government, the composition of the national unity government is already that, that unity. It represents that unity, presents that aspiration because we have the, uh, uh, the elected representative from 2020 elections, we have the representatives from the different ethnic communities, also the representatives from the different general strikes and civil disobedience movement of the spring revolution and civil society. So this is the first time ever of the most 
inclusive you know, a, a government that Myanmar people are having. So yeah, I think I really hope that ASEAN, ASEAN leaders take the stock in this very historical moment of our country and help Myanmar become a, 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 a real, like a, you know, like a, a, a viable, um, effective and, and responsible partner in this regional bloc, then move forward with the ASEAN vision of community building. That's what they, they have uh, planned and set out with the, starting with the ASEAN charter. And Myanmar has been the, uh, Myanmar military, Myanmar military has always been the problem child for the ASEAN. They must do something about it now, because otherwise all the spillover effects is also on the, on the you know, impact in the ASEAN's vision and mission, yeah? So I think it's, you know, it is not the uh, internal affairs of the Myanmar people. It is actually in the very interest of the ASEAN leaders. And they need to show their leadership to the people of ASEAN across the, the, the region, that they are there for the people, for the security and, and stability of the region, but not for the military hunter. And they must prove it now. Thank you very much, Omar. Ubo Latin, would you like to uh, reply to that also? Well, um, Omar's answer is completely covered the whole picture of Burma today. Well, uh, I only thing I need to add up is that, you know, uh, if you look at the ethnic um, organization, in the past, they are fighting for their liberation, their self-determination, for their only race and their uh, own people. But now they are in front line against the military suppression, not only for themselves, but also for the whole nation. They are in front line of the, against the mil, end of the military dictatorship in Burma. They are very committed hand to hand with the NUG, CRPH, as well as NUCC. You know, those things are very outstanding and very credible achievement that spring revolution reaching at the state so that we confident ourselves. That is Myanmar we want to be at this stage. Only thing we need is fully cooperation from the regional association as well as international community to yep. can, we can foster this process faster than ever. We have another question from the media. Peter Gustafsson from Swedish National Radio is asking how important is it that ASEAN agrees on how to treat the junta from a future geopolitical perspective in the region. I suppose that this is about the role of China and the United States and the sort of the way that the big powers relate to Southeast Asia as a sort of strategically important region. Um, would you like to, who, who would like to uh, address this? Um, Debbie, would you like to take this up? Actually, um, in this picture, everyone's talking about what about China? And this is part of a, uh, an ongoing game, diplomatic game on any issue regarding uh, Burma, Myanmar in the past that uh, ASEAN, ASEAN leaders would say, oh, it's, uh, we can't do anything because you know, really it doesn't matter. It's, what, it's all about China. And then China will say, oh, we'll do whatever, we'll follow ASEAN's lead. So everyone's pushing the buck to each other. But I think it's very important to understand if you're looking at um, security issues and geopolitical issues that um, China cannot afford uh, uh, an intensified dry season offensive in the North because it's already dealing with the COVID pandemic. It cannot afford this threat to regional secure, human security and neither can ASEAN. And also, ironically, China has been keeping in touch with the NLD um, and other stakeholders, but ASEAN has not. If ASEAN is saying they want dialogue between the junta and all the stakeholders in order to effect a, 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 um, some kind of breakthrough, then ASEAN has to take the lead and engage officially with the NUG um, it, it, because the NUG represents the elect 76 percent of elected MPs and a whole diversity of ethnic leaders and communities. So if ASEAN doesn't show that example, why should we expect the military regime to do so? 
at this point, ASEAN, China, everybody has to actually weigh in and apply more pressure on the junta. It's very clear when, when Min Ong Lai came to Jakarta and said yes, okay to the five point consensus, he had no intention of following it. And he's the biggest block. At this point, it's Min Aung Lai's personal ambition and his greed that is holding back the junta, holding back ASEAN, holding back China, and basically posing a, a, a threat to the entire region. So pressure is important because the rest of the junta needs to understand Min Aung Lai is their biggest liability and their biggest block to any way of redeeming this situation. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, there have been quite a few questions about this question of dialogue between the NUG and the SAC Tatmadaw military, um, because you know this is a, a part of the ASEAN roadmap to establish peace. And I think it's important actually, Ambassador uh, Bo Ubo, that you speak about this. Is the NUG ready to dialogue with the SAC? First point I would like to make is that since the beginning, because of the today NUG, as well as it is, you know, election ownership is the National League for Democracy led by Don San Suu Kyi. Since the inception, the NLD position is that to solve the political problem by political means. And in our ego, we also push up our agenda is for the tripartite dialogue. All these genuine representatives of ethnic group, military, and all these democratic movement representatives join together and uh, equally you know, have a dialogue and find the most sustainable solution for the country. But all these positive approach has been rejected or denied by the military. So, Positive approach of NLD, positive approach of any other, you know, democratic forces, including ourselves in the past, you know, national coalition government of the Union of Burma. Our region, our agenda has been, our call for the tripartite dialogue has been adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1994. That the best solution for future Burma to gain the restoration of democracy and sustainability development in Myanmar. So that what I'm trying to say is that we are, we would like to see the most sustainable way of, you know, engaging mutual respect and engaging for the nation building and peaceful way. But the military always rejected all the positive mindset and effort of the democratic leadership or ethnic leadership in the past. And the last, the so several um, months, they are becoming wars and that not only rejecting, but also the be becoming real terrorized organization and the nation 